All right, introduce yourself. All right, I'm uh, David Oloroso from Chicago, Illinois. So Occupy Chicago. Yep. That's awesome. Well, you came all the way out here to Occupy the Midwest here in Detroit. Um, tell me, like, first of all, what was your trip like? Uh, my trip was a little bit less than I wanted to have. Um, I took the mega bus up here, mm -hmm. and the, for the first couple hours on the trip, the AC wasn't working. We had a lot of people packed into the bus, so it was like a sauna for the first couple hours. And then right. they got the AC to start working, and they figured, oh, okay, these people are really hot, so let's blast it full power. Mm -hmm. So it went from really hot to really cold for the next like couple hours. <laughs> and then, so, so then finally, on the last like two, three hours, we found a nice little happy medium that people could at least like try and rest in peace because uh, I was coming on the midnight bus um, from Wednesday evening into Thursday morning. So I got in Detroit around 7.30 uh, Detroit time. Okay, well that's great. Now, um, first of all, we were discussing a little bit before we started this interview, you were thinking about the differences between Occupy Detroit and Occupy Chicago. So you want to go ahead and uh, share some of that? Um, yeah, but it's more of just this kind of like weird dichotomy um, between Chicago and Detroit where they have like a, on the surface they're so dissimilar like they look completely different not only to see themselves but the structure of each of their organizations mm -hmm. but what's so similar about them is their evolution and kind of their development how we all started from like basically just point zero in Occupy and kind of developed into something Mm -hmm. And the way that that happened was very, very similar in my mind. So I'll give you a little like history with Chicago. Um, at Occupy Chicago, we actually never had an encampment. Um, I think we were the second occupation to pop up in the U.S. But we just went to the heart of the financial district at Jackson LaSalle and hung out in front of the Federal Reserve Bank. Um, we had like, a small little like, temporary encampment, if you want to call that. Um, something we had some sleeping bags like out on the sidewalk, but never any tents or any structures, or right. anything like that. And so after a while, the police started harassing us for that, and we basically went from sleep on the ground to just having to stand on the sidewalk the whole day. Um, they got worse with ordinances, forcing us to move our property. Otherwise, they would toss out food carts, buckets, um, supplies, and. There's a couple times we tried to actually hold an encampment. Each time led to mass arrests, um, resulting in more than 300 uh, total. Wow. So we've kind of, from the very get-go, we learned to be a mobile occupation. Whereas a lot of cities had to deal with logistics of holding a camp at just one location and figure out how to kind of build the community around that one spot. We kind of quickly decided that we had to kind of abandon that concept of just one location and branch out to different areas of the city. Um, learn how to mobilize from from home at different like locations in the city. We talked to different organizations and started to kind of make our ways um, because the fact is that we can't just have one location. Sure. So we had to find ways to utilize the entire landscape of Chicago. So they kind of turned us into very very strong organizers um, up to this point. And with Detroit, if you look at how their environments kind of led to their own development, it's very much the same way where they have a lot more ripe opportunities to take action and to do a lot more direct actions within the communities. Mm -hmm. um, so instead of focusing more on the concept of Occupy as an organization, they were much more progressive in actually doing actions in the communities, doing house reclamation, um, as well as community outreach. Right. And so I come from pretty much the polar opposite in Chicago, where we're just getting um, into things like that, where we're taking our GA to different neighborhoods um, around the city. Sure. And here they are already like taking over like several houses at a time um, and converting them for the community. And it's exactly the type of thing that Chicago's been wanting to get into. And just the fact that um, where the similarities kind of tie into one another is that we've kind of identified that there's a lacking within our own organization and we had to try to look to the future. What is it that we have to try to adapt to? We saw that we didn't have really a chance to have an encampment in Chicago. We have to learn to be more agile, more mobile, learn how to organize strongly. Here in, uh, in Detroit, they saw, okay, well, we have a lot more uh, work to do around the city, so we don't have to spend as much time on building the organization as a whole and figuring out our different processes, especially like with GA. Instead, let's just get to work. So they're much more ahead of the game um, when it comes to doing like direct actions, and like Chicago, I think, is a lot more ahead of the game when it comes to organizing. Right. 
Well, that's awesome, though. I mean, and even then, though, at least you guys still had a spear. I mean, at 300 arrests, that's just amazing. I mean, <laughs> it's unfortunate that that's really the way that these things work out. But at the end of the day, you know, uh, things like that and the sacrifices that people make, you know, really do get attention. Now, um, it's interesting because you said you, have, you had no camp. I've been noticing a... Uh, a problem that I've seen spruce up all over the world in different occupies, like even in Sweden, in France, or whatever, there was always a problem with like people who camp versus people who don't camp. Like there's this distance. Now, I guess it's usually an internet problem. Like there are people who, yeah, I support Occupy, and I I never show up to anything, and I'm always on the internet. Mm -hmm. do, do you do you have people in Chicago that you would say like you know maybe have a lot to say about what you should be doing differently that never participate? Yeah, I mean the nature of Occupy is very tangible. It's very physical mm -hmm. um, because you have a group of people that's out there you can see, you can interact with, you can touch, you can smell, and everything. So because you have this very tangible sense of a movement, mm -hmm. then once that physicality kind of goes away, then it's like, okay, what are we left with? If we don't have that, then what do, are we left with? So that's why I think people want to really try and fight tooth and nail to hold an occupation as long as possible, even if it's just like five of them, and it's gonna be involving multiple fines and multiple arrests, and that's where I think a lot of people are kind of getting disjointed within the movement. Let's move away from doing um, encampments. Let's move away from doing like occupations. Let's get more towards like planning and organizing. People are like, no, no, no. This is what Occupy is. It's our name. And I think if people have to kind of really take a step back every now and then, just not for the sake of like, let's not be disjointed. But it's it's going to be happening down the road. There's always going to be times for reflection and analysis. And occupying public space is not something that's new. It's something that's actually been done several times in the past. And so, although the movement itself is called Occupy, occupying public space and an occupation itself is just a tactic. It's a tactic that's really no different um, than a black block, or it's no different than chalking. It's sure. just a tactic that can be effective in the right conditions um, if it's executed the proper way. So, I think once people start to kind of realize that, okay, this is a way that we can get some attention um, and kind of bring some of these issues to the forefront, but at the same time, it's not going to be our one thing that we have to stand by. We can stand by our GA processes, how we can use direct democracy to amplify the voices of the people, um, as well as um, amplifying the voices of the community and showing like what they've been doing and teaming up with them. So it's not all about us, it's more about just the people themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so I think once people kind of got past that um, Occupy was more than just space itself. It's more about the ideals of Occupy and what it stands for, for people's voices to be heard and for us to be represented properly by those who are currently representing us. Whether or not we want to still have people represent us in the future, we have everyone just be on the same playing field, is still up for discussion. But the sure. fact is we at least set a good precedent on how we want to operate. And so at least if we kind of try and stick to um, those principles that we had at the very beginning with forming general assemblies, mm -hmm. um, we can still continue this momentum going forward for the next year or two. Easily. That's really awesome. Now, I want you to share a moment with me, like one moment in particular, of something that happened out at Occupy Chicago that really sticks with your mind, like really makes you feel like you were part of something that's going to be part of history? Oh man, um, there's a lot of things to choose from in the past year. Um, like more recently, everyone knows that we had the NATO uh, summit in Chicago, had yeah. a lot of people come out. Um, but that's really no different than what I feel like we we're doing back in September and October. It was a very loud and just that was just aggressive and antagonistic towards what we are identifying as our enemy. Right. So it's just kind of us being like an angry fist, like shaking and like, you guys, you did this to us. So it's really no different than the kind of tone that was set up in September and October. Um, a little bit before then, we had this event called Chicago Spring on April 7th. And what that was set up as is our kind of coming out of hibernation because we thought we're not going to be able to face the Chicago winter. Um, we don't have an encampment, we don't have a place to go really, we don't have a place to house people, so let's find a way that we can just kind of keep things on an even keel over the winter, keep everyone in touch, keep everything going, and then on April 7th was the date that we chose. We're going to come back out with the same energy, um, the same momentum that we had in the fall. And of course we all know how everything kind of went through the spring where everyone thought warm weather, okay, we're going to get back to what it was in the right, fall. Right, right. It never happened. Right. Um, 
but instead what we actually ended up building was this awesome community event mm -hmm. where we got 2,000 people to come out with absolutely like no political agenda or any central message. It was purely a day for people um, from across Chicago to come out, have a good time, go to some teach-ins, um, do some like art fair type things, engage in one another, um, enjoy a little bit of entertainment. And just the fact that we could put something so simple on and draw so many people was kind of um, really amazing for me. But I think probably the probably the most like pinnacle mo uh, moment in Occupy Chicago for me was on day eight, um, roughly I think that was September 30th. Um, we had just about a week ago only a dozen people hanging out on a street corner, and that night we had 300 people out on. Uh, at Jackson LaSalle waiting for a critical mass, which is this massive bike ride that goes through the city, right. um, come through. And because the police were all caught up with uh, that bike ride <laughs> through the city, we had no police like, watching us. We're like, let's go for a march. And we went <laughs> for a march. We marched um, through the streets for the first time. We took the streets for the first time. We marched across Michigan Avenue, took Michigan Avenue. Um, then we marched through Millennium Park, danced under the bean, uh, took the Jay Pritzker uh, Pavilion stage, which is like massive, like super expensive uh, stage built in Millennium Park. And it was just amazing the fact that we went from the simplest like idea out on the street corner and just exploded like exponentially into this like mass like movement of 300 people from a dozen in a week. It was like just mind blowing like how people could just revolve around an idea it wasn't what you thought or what i thought it's we want this idea to exist in the future and the fact that people came out in that in hordes in a matter of a week was just absolutely astonishing to me i have to say that's one of the things i love the most about occupy is that it unifies people from a lot of different backgrounds i mean some of them like you're going to run into socialists you're going to run into communists you're going to run into anarchists you're even going to run into some free market libertarian types you're going to run into so many different people who at least agree on the common goal of that things need to change that we need to bring attention to the issues that need to change and I, I think that's a beautiful aspect of this movement now I kind of did this backwards something I usually do is I ask people like what was the precipice what was the moment in your life that made you decide to become an activist um, let's see when this starts I mean if you want to get really technical you can deduce everything down back almost to birth at, mm -hmm. at some point um, everything kind of builds on it as we go uh, forward um, but I'd say if you want to get a little more specific, it would probably be when I was uh, in college. Like, oh, big surprise, it seemed like it's <laughs> everyone's story here. Um, but it wasn't that I did a lot of like my own like research and like my own like experimentation with activism in college. It was just, probably just the opposite. Um, I actually went to Arizona State uh, for three years studying industrial engineering. So at one one side I wanted to just like have a study job that paid a lot of money and right. I wanted to go to college and have fun uh, and whatnot. But it was the fact that I started to run out of money, had to come back home, um, was planning on transferring to Northern Illinois. I took the year off to save up a little money and it was actually in that year off when I was like, starting to get bored. That's when I started to actually look into other things, um, just topics that naturally interested me that um, start to plant the seed initially and what starts to actually <coughs> um, give it some water, kind of give it a little bit of growth was actually music and hip-hop music specifically. The socially conscious artists like Lupe Fiasco, Most Def, uh, XV, Talib Kweli, Immortal Technique, uh, people like that. Um, that some music brought you to activism. Yeah, so it really was music um, and more specifically it was Lupe Fiasco's uh, third album, Lasers, mm -hmm. which stands for Love Always Shines Every Time Remember to Smile. And what, what along with that album was a 25 point manifesto, which a lot of those points um, are pretty much similar principles to what Occupy stands for. And out of me fighting for that album to be released because he was under like some two year wait for it to come out and the record label was just like, no, we were thinking we'll release it then, no, we're pushing yeah. it back. It's coming out soon, actually, no, we have to push it back again. It was just like typical artist label like bickering for the most part. And the, the fans like really wanted this album for a long time and I actually helped set up a protest in Chicago to get the album out. Not so much because I liked his music, but the idea behind it. Sure. That 
people should be creating their own futures. They shouldn't be standing around waiting for it to come to them. And it was built on principles of like peace and solidarity and uh, wisdom and knowledge, things like that. I really want to really get out into the world. I want to unleash those ideas out into the world for people to kind of share with. Um, and so from there, I um, met three people through the protest. We decided we were going to start our own nonprofit organization, kind of based on the same principles of that and kind of along the same lines of Occupy, um, not so much the whole horizontal consensus based model, um, but still the same ideals for the most sure. part. And um, I actually went to Occupy Chicago on the first day thinking I'm going to go talk to some of these activists and try and recruit them for my nonprofit organization. But the longer I uh, hung out at Occupy Chicago, the bigger of a draw it was for me. And I just got sucked in. I just couldn't leave um, after a while. I mean, it was what I kind of decided I got to be doing this. I don't know how long I'm going to be doing it, but I have to do it. It's really my responsibility to take up um, this opportunity and use it as best as my ability can. That's, it's definitely something you can't turn off after you've turned it on. You can't look at the world the same ever again. Yeah. So, you know, this has been awesome, and thank you for representing Occupy Chicago Glad here and in, in, um, Occupy the Midwest, and um, I'll make sure that this video is available to Occupy Chicago. All right, thanks a lot. Thanks again for being on V-Radio. Yeah, thank you.